Hi, I'm Jonathan Beck, uh, pastor at Munn Holland, and we're talking about the unshakable life. We've been walking through Psalm 15. Uh, I encourage you to see the other videos if you haven't, that what it means for us to have an unshakable life. What it says in Psalm 15 is that ultimate goal is to be in the very presence of God, to allow His life to enfold us, to allow Him to be ever-present with us and us ever-present with Him. The unshakable life comes when we are empowered, we are infused with the Holy Spirit. And that is what we're seeking. Psalm 15 talks about how we live into that, how we have that unshakable life. Listen to this psalm. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary, who may live on your holy hill, the one whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, the one who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, the one who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends money without usury, and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. This is the word of God for the people of God. I'm so glad to have this word because it helps direct my life. If I want to be fully in the presence of God, if I want to walk in that way that leads to wonderful, abundant life, then this is the way to do it. Certain steps. It's an action uh, point for us to begin to live more fully in God's presence. How would you like to have an incredible neighbor, a neighbor who always encourages you, a neighbor who walks by and you know you're going to be cheered up, a neighbor who cares and, and it listens to you and intends to you, uh, whatever need you may have. How would you like to have a neighbor like that? My next question is, could you be a neighbor like that? You know, it's not easy to always be the kind of neighbor that we would like to have, but we can be that unshakable neighbor that's a rock for those in the neighborhood, that's a place of refuge for those who are battered and those who are in need. There's an old story uh, about a man, he goes to the doctor and he says, doctor, my, my arm hurts when I move it like this. And what's the doctor say? Stop moving it like that. Just stop moving it. You know, if it were only that easy. But think about it for a minute. You know, in our lives, we get caught up in, in our own uh, picadillos, our, our own uh, wanting to be right, our knee-jerk reactions, our impatience, our anger, and using words that, that we know are hurting and cut deep. And we, we do all this stuff, and the best thing we could do for those around us is simply stop doing it. Maybe that's the best good we could do. At least it's a strong step in the right direction, right? You know, in the Old Testament, we have the Ten Commandments. Two of those are stated positively, and eight of them are stated negatively. Think about that. What God is saying is do these two things, and, and that is good. And, and then really stop doing all this other. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul takes the same approach in that great love passage. He, he names eight things that love is. Love is patient, love is kind. And, then, and he goes on eight different ways, always protects, always hopes, always perseveres, love and never fails, and has this wonderful where we're heading with love into the presence of God. And then he says, okay, but here are the guardrails. And he has eight things not to do because they are unloving. You know, sometimes we need to know not only where we're going, but we need to know those guardrails so that we can do no harm. To do no harm to to walk in that way there are a couple things that we can do in our lives number one we can have that radical trust in God that God holds us in his hand and he has our future already that that we can trust our present to God so that our future will also be entrusted to him and, and that's really important if I don't trust God with my future, then I'm going to do whatever I think is right, whatever I want to do, right? But if I can trust God, I can live at peace, and I can not have to insist on my way, but I can do no harm. Trust God. Trust God with outcomes. Trust God with your future. We, we can also have that living, vital relationship with Jesus, and that is incredibly important. 
If we have that vital relationship with Jesus, we're allowing Jesus to teach us, to give us wisdom and his guidance. We need that living relationship so that no longer are we going to be stuck in, this is my position, that's your position. But the question's going to be for us, what's Jesus' position? What does Jesus think about this? When we have that lively relationship, uh, God begins to take off those rough edges and, and to shape us into something that is going to be really beautiful and do wonderful work in the world. Have that live relation, lively relationship with Jesus and get past fear. You know, fear inhibits us in so many ways. We don't want to be a doormat. We don't want to be at someone else's mercy. We don't have, want to have the sense of loss of power. And so sometimes out of that fear, we will get aggressive and try to take our own, to have our own outcome, and we will do what we shouldn't do. When I, uh, my wife and I, we love to dance, and one time we were in a, this big fair that was going on out in this uh, park, and they had these great uh, Cajun band that was playing. Everybody was sitting around and listening, but there was this open area in front of the stage. I said, Mary Kay, let's get up and dance. She said, John, I don't want, there's nobody out here. I said, come on, we'll break the ice. And she's like, John, you always say, uh, come on, we will. People will start flooding out and dancing as soon as we start dancing. <laughs> so I'd get her out there, and we'd start da dancing. We'd do a little bit of our, our Cajun dancing. And then she, no one would come up, and she'd get a little bit embarrassed. John, let's sit down. I said, no, no let's, let's keep it up. Let's have fun. And after a while, a few people got up and started dancing as well. They enjoyed it. Sometimes we have to break the ice and do what's right so that we can begin to bring uh, uh, peace and goodness into the world. We need to examine our lives. John Wesley examined his life at the end of every day and asked, Lord, what can I do better? And he made commitments to very practical steps to live a life of love. How can we be good to our neighbor. What is the good we can do? We just talked about how to do no harm, but what is the good we can do? There are some four very practical ways that we can care for our neighbors, especially in this COVID time. You know, you can't love your neighbor unless you're friendly. I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? But, but it starts with being friendly. You can't get to know them until you talk with them, until you invite them into a conversation. Simply being friendly opens lives, opens doors, and creates new relationships. It seems really obvious, but sometimes we miss that point. We wait for the other person to be friendly rather than to initiate that. In Proverbs chapter 18, it says, a man who has friends must himself be friendly. Good advice, good advice. Put yourself out there. Be friendly to your neighbor. The second thing that we can do is to encourage our neighbors continually, to encourage them. Everybody's looking for hope right now. I mean, this pandemic has been going on and on and on. Nobody had any idea that we would be in these different levels of lockdown a year later. Unbelievable. People are tired, they're strung out, the anxiety has, has gotten to them. And I know it's gotten to me and it's, I'm sure it's gotten to you, that underlying anxiousness of instability and insecurity of knowing what's going to happen in the future. You know, we need to give encouragement to people. Uh, Proverbs 12 says, Worry weighs a person down, but encouraging word cheers that person up. We're called to be people who cheer others up, to be a neighbor that brings joy especially in an unsettled time of this pandemic. You know, early in the, this pandemic, uh, people, it was so wonderful to see, people would um, write cards of encouragement, hand them to their neighbors. Maybe with sidewalk chalk, I also saw uh, kids writing love, and God loves you, and things like that on the sidewalk, so people would walk by and they'd see that. There's so many encouraging words that you can give, especially as you become friendly and get to know them. Begin to understand their story and give them that word of hope. As we serve our neighbors cheerfully, uh, it is a, a way to, to let people know they are not on their own. There's someone who cares about them, someone who's going to reach out and give them that hand to serve. We all have ways in which we can help someone else. It uh, says in 1 John, you know, suppose a person has enough 
and then someone in need comes and, and asks for help or food or whatever it is. How can the love of God be in them if they don't help them out? You know, there are a lot of people who need help. And this is the great opportunity because the need for help is great. It's all around us. Uh, my neighbor, uh, uh, Vic and Lorena, wonderful, wonderful neighbors, love them so much. And uh, he's getting a little bit older and uh, is having trouble being able to get out and work in his yard as much as he loves it. And what a joy it was for me to be able to go over and to mow his yard, pick up his leaves. That little act of service is encouraging. You can bring some food to someone, go and, and get groceries for them, to, to let them know someone cares about you enough to do something for you, to be moved with practical compassion. That's a beautiful thing. People need help, and serving them really creates that understanding that you are not about yourself, but you're about God's work of loving your neighbor. Another thing that you can do, and this is the last and probably the most important, is to share Jesus Christ with them. To share the good news. You know, uh, back on YouTube, uh, John uh, Krasinski, I believe his name is, uh, he started this good news. Man, it exploded. Everybody uh, loved to listen in the good news. It was humorous, it was fun, it was interesting, it was moving. Good, good news. And then people started uh, starting their own good news uh, videos, and uh, we had that here at Mount Holland. What he started with good news was exactly what we needed then and continue to need now. People need good news. Um, you know, a lot of people are going through this life alone. They don't know where to turn. They don't need, to, they don't know how to fix a relationship that's so broken in their lives, or where to look for forgiveness, the, the, the freedom from, from guilt and sin. They don't know. They've heard. Most of them have heard about Jesus. Many of them even attended a church when they were young, but they don't know. They haven't experienced. And we need to share the best, best, best good news of all, and that is the good news of Jesus Christ, who came to forgive us, to empower us, to reshape us so that we can live in the way, the truth, and the life. Share the gospel. It's not hard. You know what's nice is that we are all walking around so much more seeing neighbors. You know, it was amazing how this one lady, uh, we, my wife and I were walking around, this is early on, and this lady came up to us from across the street in this neighborhood and said, hi, uh, what's your name? I'm Vicki or whatever her name was. And we started talking and, and where do you live? And she started just being so wonderfully uh, excited and, and outgoing. And we found out through our conversation that she had a terrible bout of depression and lived with her, uh, her curtains shut in the dark in her home for nearly a year. Pandemic happened. And she herself said, I need my neighbors. As everybody was expressing that, I need my neighbors. And she got out and started meeting everybody. And we talked, and, and we talked about the Lord, and how the Lord gives us hope and encouragement. Uh, she herself uh, also was a believer. But it was so wonderful to have that time, to see that someone is experiencing the good news and the refreshment of Christ, and she can share that with others. All we have to do is tell our own story what God has done for us, where we've found forgiveness, encouragement, where we've found direction in the wisdom for life. I encourage you, if you want an unshakable neighbor, be that unshakable neighbor first. You will be blessed beyond belief.